The county borough of Tynemouth was created in 1849 and comprised the busy industrial town of North Shields as well as the outlying villages of Percy Main, Cullercoats and Tynemouth itself. At the outbreak of the war, the borough had a population of over 58,000. Tynemouth Borough was booming in the peaceful years before 1914, with thousands of local people employed in maritime industries, coal mining and fishing. Within weeks of Britain's declaration of war, men from Tynemouth begin to fall. Each man's home is marked in the period that his death occurred. As the map moves on through time, each man's home is marked with a yellow dot. British Expeditionary Force is thrown into action to support the French Army at Mons, Le Cateau, the Marne and the Aisne. After over 500,000 casualties, both sides dig in and trench warfare begins. A local school teacher, David Wallace, writes home to his class, telling them that I'm beginning to think I'm bulletproof. But the truth was, by the time they received the letter, he was already dead. A British Anzac and French assault at Gallipoli fails. On the Western Front, initial British successes at Neuve Chapelle cannot be followed up. British territorial units suffer their first significant losses of the war. Germany makes the first use of poison gas. In 1900, Fred Monks had been sent to the Wellesley training ship on the Tyne for frequenting the company of thieves. By 1914, he had risen to be a sub-lieutenant in the Royal Navy. His ship, HMS Vicknor, went down with all hands off the coast of Ireland. The British launch a costly offensive at Luce, the first mass engagement of Kitchener's new army units. Sir John French is replaced as commander of the British Expeditionary Force in France and Flanders by Sir Douglas Haig. Steel helmets are worn by the British Army for the first time. The Old Etonian Captain Basil Knott was the son of Sir James Knott, owner of the Prince shipping line and one of the richest men on Tyneside. His brother, Major James Knott, was killed the following year on the Somme. They are buried together outside Ypres. The greatest naval battle in history is fought off Jutland in the North Sea. The Royal Navy suffers heavy losses, but the German High Seas Fleet is forced back to port. Britain introduces conscription to counter dwindling voluntary recruitment. The German army attacks French positions at Verdun. Robert Hogg was killed when a shell landed in his trench. His last words were, My wife, my poor bairns. He leaves six children. The British and French launch a major offensive along the River Somme. On the first day of the battle, over 19,000 British soldiers are killed, including 78 men from Tynemouth Borough alone. Beaumont Hamel is captured in November, but there has been no strategic breakthrough. Total British casualties number over 400,000. Herbert Asquith resigns, and David Lloyd George becomes Prime Minister. While Sergeant Billy Grant and his Tyneside Scottish platoon lay pinned down in no man's land on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, one man shouted out, I've been shot in the arse! To which Billy Grant replied, Haven't we all, son? Billy died soon after this, having been caught in the side by machine gun fire. Germany launches unrestricted U-boat warfare to try and starve Britain of food and materials. In Russia, Tsar Nicholas II is forced to abdicate. The simultaneous explosion of 19 huge mines under the German positions along the Messines Ridge brings a welcome victory for the British Army in Flanders. While home on leave in November 1916, William Lathlane had married Esther Simpson in colour coats. Six weeks later, he was killed in action. The Battle of Passchendaele begins with some initial success for the Allies, but bad weather makes progress impossible in the mud of Flanders. Both sides suffer huge casualties. 
the last airship raid on Britain is carried out by eleven Zeppelins. Harry Brunton worked as a market gardener before the war and was a well-known Sunday school teacher at St Andrew's Church in Preston Village. His dear brother Jacob had been killed in 1916. Harry leaves three-year-old Henry and baby Phyllis. The new Soviet Russian government sues for peace, releasing a large number of German troops to the Western Front. General Ludendorff's spring offensive forces the Allies back in Flanders with very heavy losses. The German army is within sight of Amiens and begins to shell Paris. The war hangs in the balance. Major Charles Hardy had been a draftsman in the Admiralty Drawing Offices at Hawthorne Leslie Shipyard at Heaven on Tyne before he enlisted as a private in the Tyneside Scottish in 1914. His first child, also called Charles, was born in July 1918, but his father had been killed three months earlier during the Great German Spring Offensive in Flanders. The Second Battle of the Marne ends in a massive defeat for the German army on the 8th of August, and mobile warfare resumes after almost four years in the trenches. The Allies breach the Hindenburg Line and Germany seeks an armistice. Fighting officially ends at 11am on the 11th of November 1918. Captain Robert Perks, DSO, had trained for the bar before the war. In 1918 he was killed leading a frontal assault against Austrian machine guns at the river Piave on the Italian front. In the last three months of the war, three women in the borough, Mrs Carr, Mrs Adamson and Mrs Donohoe, each receives the heartbreaking news that they have lost a third son to the Great War. Losses continue as men die from wounds and disease caused by military service. A Spanish flu pandemic will kill more people around the world than the four years of fighting. Gunner William Cowell and his Royal Artillery Battery had survived the war, but all of them were to die of typhoid in a Turkish military hospital after drinking water from an infected well near Constantinople. Between 1919 and 1923, the Reverend R. E. Holmes, Vicar of Tynemouth, and Mr. Harold Taylor compiled a roll of honour to record the names and addresses of more than 1,700 men from the borough who fell in the Great War. The Shields Daily News reported in 1923 that these gentlemen, acting quite independently, kept a record of casualties from the beginning until the end of the war. It is through their painstaking collaboration that we have such an excellent roll of honour to hand down to posterity. It is thanks to their efforts and the support of the Heritage Lottery Fund and over 70 local volunteers that we in the Tynemouth World War I Commemoration Project have been able to research all those lost lives as this generation's tribute to the men of Tynemouth who fell in the Great War. <laughs>